Before I get started this morning, I'd just like to thank Sarah again for co-leading worship with me. Sarah and I met 10 years ago when I was a chaplain intern at Children's Hospital, and Sarah was my supervisor. So it is a real joy to be able to be ministering together again after all these years. And thank you to Antoinette for serving as our liturgist, to Fran, who will be offering our mission moment, to Barry for your accompaniment this morning, and to our faithful deacons for all of your care and support in worship week in and week out. Would you please pray with me? O oh, ever-present God, come, come to us now, still our busy minds, stir our spirits, and open our hearts to your word and the words that you place on each of our hearts. And O oh, dear God, may the words that I have to offer here this morning please you and honor you and glorify your holy, holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning again. And I'd like to also greet those of you who are worshiping with us online. We are so glad that you are participating in our worship service this morning in this way. I must begin this morning by acknowledging that it was a struggle to prepare the sermon for this morning. After all, in this Yuletide season of singing Christmas carols and exchanging gifts and attending family gatherings and work parties for Christmas, during this most wonderful time of the year, as Andy Williams used to sing, who wants to recall this horrific story from the Bible, commonly referred to as the massacre? of the innocents. Our gospel reading for today is a very disturbing story that we encounter every three years in our lectionary cycle, because Matthew is the only gospel that includes this difficult and painful story. As an aside, years ago when I was in seminary, my classmates and I used to commiserate and encourage one another at this time because we were often the ones who had to preach on this text as student pastors, since most settled pastors often took much needed vacation time on this Sunday after such a busy Advent and Christmas season. Now back to our text for this morning. As you may recall, Herod, the so-called great, ruled all of Palestine at the time of Jesus' birth. Now, Herod was known for his magnificent buildings and improvement projects throughout Jerusalem, including expanding and refurbishing the temple. But, as we all know, Herod, was also in love with power and control and wealth and prestige. And to say that he was an egomaniac is an understatement. For Herod was someone who appeared to be especially confident, and yet we all know that his ego was exceptionally fragile. Herod was extremely insecure and paranoid by the extent that he was, to the extent that he was even threatened by the news of the birth of an innocent baby. For it was the wondrous birth of the one named Jesus, who earlier in Matthew chapter 2 inspired and prompted and led the Magi to travel a great distance from the east, exclaiming, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. And so, 
all of that, as you may recall, is the backstory of our gospel reading for this morning, which is often referred to as the flight into Egypt. Now, of course, there are many different ways to interpret this distressing story, which I have to believe stirs up some feelings of anxiety and maybe even panic within ourselves each time that we read it, even though we know the ending. We know that Mary and Joseph and young Jesus will eventually return from Egypt safely and make their home in Nazareth. Now, as I wrestled with this text this time, I found myself being especially drawn to Joseph and his steady and thoughtful and patient and faithful presence throughout this pericope. This time, I was struck by how much Joseph has to teach us, this humble and understated one, this one who doesn't speak a word in this story, in this foundational story of our Christian tradition. Now, even though Joseph does play a central role in the birth narrative, of course, as Jesus' earthly father, there isn't much written about him in biblical commentaries and journal articles relative to Mary and the disciples and other key figures in our biblical stories. It is very interesting to me that even though Joseph is mentioned in all four Gospels, not a word of what he ever said it was recorded. We've all heard that expression before that actions speak louder than words. And if that is true, then Joseph speaks volumes. Here is a man who was engaged to be married when he learned that his fiancée was pregnant with a child who was not his. That in and of itself is certainly enough for Joseph or anyone to have an ex ex existential crisis at that time. And yet, Joseph seemed to have this capacity to pause and to reflect and pray and discern. And so, as we learn back in the first chapter of Matthew, Joseph was able to open himself up to listen for God's prompting and guidance in that time of mixed feelings and confusion and distress. And it was then, it was then that an angel of God spoke to Joseph through a dream so that Joseph would understand how God was calling him. And when Joseph woke up, he did what God had commanded him to do. And as you already know, Mary and he were then married according to God's plan. And then the next time that we read about Joseph is in our reading for today from Matthew chapter 2 in this story that takes place just after the Magi had left for home. Again, the angel of God came to Joseph through a dream, and this time instructed Joseph to flee to Egypt with Mary and their young child, Jesus, and not to return until the angel appears to them again. And then, later on in our text for today, the angel of God returns to Joseph, speaks to him one more time in his dream, and instructs him to get up and take your family back to the land of Israel. And that is exactly what Joseph did. Our gospel reading 
for this morning is significant for a number of reasons. But reading it again, here and now, at this time in our life together as First Church, it speaks to me differently than ever before. It speaks to me about the spiritual practice of discernment. Discernment, as you may know, literally means to separate or to decide or to distinguish between two things. And so spiritual discernment, then, is simply trying to be more faithful in listening for God's voice and for God's direction in our lives. With the understanding, of course, that God speaks to each one of us in different ways and at different times along our faith journeys. Maybe some of you are like Joseph and have experienced clarity or discovered the answers you had been seeking through your dreams. In psychotherapy, this is referred to as dream analysis or dream interpretation. Perhaps God speaks to you often through the stories of Holy Scripture. Or maybe it's through the voices of others or the mentors or wise ones who God places in your lives. I know that for many of you, God often touches your spirits through the gift of music or the visual arts or through poetry or other inspired writing, or when you are simply outdoors in nature and you finally find yourself at peace. For me, God often speaks to me through my gut, so to speak. There are times that I just get a gut feeling about something. Or perhaps that's my intuition, which then prompts me to seek clarification and gather more information. Regardless of how God speaks to us, it is certain that our living and loving God longs to connect with each one of us and to be in relationship with us in ways that motivate us, inspire us and in the decisions that we make and in the lives that we lead together. Now, I certainly don't need to tell any of you that here at First Church, we are currently moving through a time of significant change and transition as we name and claim all of our mixed feelings that are natural and to be expected and that come with the recent staffing changes here at church. And yet, and yet at the very same time, this is also a time of hope and promise. As search committees form and earnest and thoughtful and meaningful and productive conversations take place as members and leaders of the church come together to listen to one another, to discuss together and plan together and brainstorm together as they discern together. All of us, every single one of us, is called to be faithful and discerning, like Joseph, as we continue to serve our congregation and the wider community while we live into God's dream for First Church today and for tomorrow. I'd like to close this morning 
with some words of inspiration that were written by the late Reverend Henry Nowen, an author and sage and spiritual mentor to many. These words are certainly words to ground us during times of uncertainty and change and in times of discernment. He writes, often we want to be able to see into the future. We say, how will next year be for us? Or where will we be in five or 10 years from now? There are no answers to these questions now. Mostly, we have just enough light to see the next step. That is we, what we have to do in the coming hour or the following day. The art of living is to enjoy what we can see and not complain about what remains in the dark. When we are able to take that next step with the trust that we will have enough light for the step that follows, we can walk through life with joy and be surprised at how far we go. Let us rejoice in the little light that we do carry and not ask for the great beam that would take all the shadows away. Thanks be to God. Amen.